Hello, good afternoon. This is John Forrester. I um, want to thank you for joining us today as we discuss uh, trust situs and uh, how it affects you know, your planning and how it'll maximize the benefits to your clients. I'm here with my partner in crime, Mike Vito. And um, just so you guys know the logistics here, we uh, plan on having this presentation last for about one hour. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we'd like to hold them to the end, or if you wish to uh, type them into your screen, uh, we'll take them at the end. Um, if it turns out we run out of time for some reason, uh, we'll do our best to, to follow up on any uh, inquiries that, that, that linger. Um, just so everybody knows, the uh, slide deck um, and the recording of the uh, webinar will be sent to all of you uh, after uh, the presentation, so you'll have um, what we have. Um, and also, uh, to the extent that people uh, ask questions, we'll go ahead and repeat them too, and not, not just for repeating sake, just because we are uh, recording here. Um, without further ado, I'm going to dive right into our uh, slide deck today. So where are you now and where would you like to be? Um, it's a fairly philosophically broad question, but we'll pose it in the context of uh, trust planning. See if I can advance the slide here. I'm having a technology uh, faux pas here. You know, give me one second. All right, so that tells you uh, what a wonderful guy I am and how smart I am. Now you know the same about Mike Vito. <laughs> <laughs> this tells you that uh, everything you hear today cannot be relied upon, so that's always comforting. And now we're going to talk about the hot topics. Um, so, so let's dive into you know, trust nexus and state law. Um, you know, my opinion, and, and I've been practicing in this area for about 30 years, this is probably one of the most overlooked areas. Um, unless somebody specifically comes in, one to create a trust with a particular situs, at their request, they say, I'd like to create a South Dakota trust for any number of reasons, usually some of these places are selected for creditor protection. Um, or alternatively, you have a professional trust company that mandates that the trust be situs in a certain jurisdiction um, for their purposes in part. Uh, but otherwise, this is a conversation that often doesn't occur. People in the practicing world make the assumption that where, uh, wherever the trust is being drafted is sort of its automatic you know, nexus and state situs, um, with the exception of maybe New York and California, where I think routinely practitioners figure no one uh, that's practicing <laughs> in this area with any regularity wants their trust to be connected to these places because of the high uh, <clears throat> state income tax. So at any rate, you know, why do I care about this? Well, chiefly, uh, to reduce state income taxes. Um, in some respects, people want what are called directed trusteeships. They want to retain more family control and only delegate out that which they deem to be sort of, quote, ministerial or administrative. Um, you know, probably the closest thing you can get to a private trust company feel without forming a private trust company itself which tends to be a somewhat costly endeavor. Um, maximizing tax deferral, you know, a big one because many states have uh, allowed people to opt out of the uh, rule against perpetuities. One of the few things you learn in uh, law school that you remember because you want to forget. Um, asset protection, any number of people uh, seeking to protect either themselves uh, in a sort of a, a self-created asset protection trust and or family. 
um, enhancing flexibility. You know, this has been a big ticket item as of late. You have many states adopting various rules around decanting and judicial versus non-judicial varieties of that, making it you know easier to alter irrevocable trusts. And then trust confidentiality, which is a big ticket item, probably also most frequently overlooked. Um, when do clients wish to disclose the existence of a trust and provide a complete statement uh, to a beneficiary? Sort of an odd thing to overlook because I can tell you, uh, once it becomes top of mind, it becomes very top of mind. Um, and by default, most states, if nothing is said, you know, if the trust is silent, it would typically be age of majority, and most clients would unlikely uh, be willing to provide that data to an 18-year-old beneficiary. At any rate, trust nexus. So how do you get connected to a particular state if those items that we just discussed are of uh, interest uh, to you or your clients? Uh, well, first of all, there has to be a connection to the state that you're interested in. You know, the term uh, often used is nexus, but there just needs to be some kind of meaningful connection to that particular locale. And nexus can be established on the basis of uh, a number of things when the trust is created. And this, again, important to emphasize at the time the trust is created. That's when you want to connect these dots. So the settler's residence, uh, the trustee's residence, the beneficiary's residence, the principal place of trust administration, that's probably a big ticket item, uh, or the trust holds real property in the state of interest. So those are, those are the big ticket items relative to connecting uh, jurisdiction um, and having some kind of nexus. So reducing state income taxes is on our hit list, you know, as a chief rationale for wanting to have a nexus to a particular locale. Um, an important factor here in trust design is the potential application of a state's income tax structure to undistributed trust income. So let's say that you have a non-grantor trust um, and there's fairly substantial assets in the trust and you have relatively young beneficiaries. This is sort of the classic paradigm. And the client looks at you and says, you know, Mike, um, we don't have any intention of distributing out any income or tipping off the beneficiaries till much later in life. And so Mike will sort of say, you know, how much later? The client might say, well, a decade. I mean, these, tr these trust beneficiaries are like 15, have no intention of letting them know this is out there or making distributions to them. Oh, okay. So obviously annual recurring state income taxation against the undistributed income can have a pretty meaningful impact on this trust over the course of years or decades, um, particularly when you're likely to be run up the federal brackets pretty quickly uh, because of the way they work relative to undistributed trust income. So state income tax treatment among states varies significantly, as just as you might suspect, you have anywhere from, on the one hand, a place like Florida to, you know, California on the other extreme. So Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington State, Wyoming, these are places that have zero state income tax, obviously of keen interest to many well-to-do clients. And then Delaware, little twist, um, does not impose a state income tax on certain non-grantor trusts where there's no resident beneficiaries and no Delaware source income and the trust is accumulating income. So again, you could have a trust in our example that has millions or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in it accumulating income and not paying any state income tax in Delaware. Of course, like I said, at the other end of the spectrum, you have places like California and New York where state income taxes uh, can exceed, you know, 13 percent. So needless to say, this is a meaningful impact on an annual recurring basis. 
So location, 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 much like any you know, good real estate agent will tell you, uh, is very important. So states tax you know, trust income based on a combination of factors no different than they try to trust people who are in their state uh, based on similar connections. So the residence of, at the, of the settler at the time the trust is established is a big ticket item. Residence of the trustee or a co-trustee. Um, so, you know, here, if you're picking, you know, family members, you know, Aunt Tilly and Uncle Bob, uh, because, quote, they don't charge anything, uh, but in parens, they happen to live in California, well, they might end up being the most expensive trustee selection in the face of the earth. So you might want to think long and hard about people that don't charge, but live in places that are, quote, tax undesirable. The residence of a beneficiary, probably not a lot you can do about that one. I mean, if your kitties are living over in uh, California because they love the weather or in New York because they love the vibe, um, probably not much you can do about, you know, their location. Principal place of trust administration, this is something you can do something about. I mean, you can obviously pick a trust company that has its place of administration in a key jurisdiction like, you know, Nevada, South Dakota, Delaware, and the location of the trust assets. Also something you can do uh, something about, a um, little harder if it's, you know, real estate. But then again, you know, you can try to use entity ownership and some other things to scuttle that issue. Um, I'll let Mike pick up here, but this is probably one of the more seminal cases um, that recently appeared on the radar screen. Mike? Um, good afternoon. You, you may have read something about the Kimberly Rice Kastner case. Um, that was a, a rare tax case to hit the Supreme Court uh, earlier this year. Um, and the issue is, uh, the issue is exactly uh, the subject we were discussing. How do you tax undistributed trust income at the state level? Um, looking at the facts, I was actually surprised that North Carolina pursued it this far. The deck was stacked against them. Um, in this particular case, I'll start with the issue. Uh, the issue is, is the location of a discretionary uh, trust beneficiary alone sufficient to permit state taxation of the undistributed trust income? Here, just about everything pointed away from North Carolina other than the fact that the beneficiary and her children lived there during the relevant time. No distributions were made during that time. The, trust, the, trustee, uh, began, the trust began in New York. The initial trustee was in New York. Pretty much everything was not in North Carolina. Um, and the holding, which I was not surprised to see, says no. Uh, where distributions are fully in the discretion of the trustee, no distributions have been made from the trust and the, the location of the beneficiary is the sole connection to that state. No, the trust does not have the uh, the state does not have jurisdiction to tax that trust. Um, I expect that we'll see this issue develop a little further over the next couple of years um, as you run into cases that have other compelling facts to them. But here it was pretty clear cut and I was and I was happy with the result. Um, so that's uh, state income taxation. And again, there, there are many gradations of that, and you do have to be careful of where your contacts are, such as the trustees. And as we're about to discuss, uh, sort of semi-trustees who uh, are involved in directed trusts. And so now we turn our attention to the issue of control, directed trusts. Uh, many states have enacted directed trustee statutes that permit the, the division of a, of a trustee's traditional uh, role uh, that allows for a, additional levels of control at the family level. Uh, sometimes these are referred to as trust advisors or trust directors. Um, the advisors direct the trustee as to certain decisions, and it can take many different forms. Uh, the most common uh, forms of trust advisors are distribution advisors and investment advisors. Occasionally, you can also have a business advisor that is, uh, is, to, is to direct what goes on with respect to specific holdings of the trust. But basically, within their sphere, the trust advisor is like a mini trustee over that particular decision. Uh, a directed trust can fit well with the goal of creating nexus in a tax advantage state. Uh, for example, a New York client or other high tax state client may decide to create a Delaware trust with a financial institution that's located in Delaware or South Dakota or somewhere else with a preferred, uh, preferred uh, treatment. 
Now be careful, uh, this comes with a warning. As I mentioned, the location of the trust advisor is also important. Um, they have trustee-like duties. Um, they're most often considered fiduciaries and taxing authorities have a very good case for treating them as if they are trustees, which would create nexus for taxation. Um, so in a perfect world, your trust advisors would be somewhere other than um, the state you're trying to get away from. Um, and I expect that this type of trust will only increase in importance over the next uh, several years as we continue to focus on the area of state taxation. Uh, the next subject is, it sort of goes along with the tax part of it by maximizing your tax deferral, um, also known as trust duration, or the rule against perpetuity. Sorry, I missed that. Could you uh, say it? We're going to stop Siri for the moment. Um, so rule against perpetuities. That was actually my favorite subject in law school. Um, so I have a, sort of a vested interest here. Um, a state law that governs the trust also typically governs the trust perpetuities period. Um, traditionally, that is lives in being plus 21 years, if you can remember back. Um, states have modified that common law rule over time to permit so-called dynasty trusts. Um, some say that the rule goes on for a certain number of years. Um, some have eliminated it entirely and instead just require that the trustee have the power to sell assets during a particular period. So here is a uh, brief summary of some of the major uh, types of rules. Uh, for example, Alaska, Delaware, Illinois, South Dakota, there's no perpetuities period. Uh, New Jersey also has no perpetuities period. Uh, California, they have a common law rule or 90 years. Um, that, that's one of the modified uh, compromises. Florida and Nevada picked uh, you know, 360 and 365 days, respectively, uh, as a legislative compromise. New York still has the traditional common law rule, which is another reason, aside from state taxation, uh, that if you have the ability to create a trust outside of New York, it would be a good idea. Um, otherwise, you're not getting the maximum deferral that you could possibly get um, and the maximum benefit of the, of the tax exemptions you may allocate to the trust. Utah and Wyoming, if they picked a thousand years, that would probably be sufficient. Um, but um, each state has its own. And again, this area is, uh, is fluid as different states position themselves to try to, to try to be more attractive to the trust business. I would expect that over the next couple of years, there will be other states joining the pack. Another uh, area of interest is asset protection. Um, you're creating a trust. Um, why wouldn't you want it to be protected if you can? Um, many clients understandably have concerns about protecting the trust assets from claims of the beneficiary's creditors, particularly from spouses or future former spouses. This is another area where the rules vary by state. The creditor protection will be different from one state to the other depending on your governing law. Uh, Delaware, for example, uh, prevents a creditor from attaching trust assets even if the beneficiary has committed an intentional tort, uh, last we looked, while Georgia does not. Um, in California, Delaware, Florida, a trustee is, uh, may not be protected from a child support or child or spousal support obligations, but trusts can be protected from these types of obligations in Alaska, South Dakota, and Nevada. Uh, and again, as states position themselves to become more attractive, some of these elements may change over time. Um, South Dakota in particular has been on the forefront of trying to position itself to attract trust business. Uh, another area uh, to consider when looking at your jurisdictional menu is the potential for modifying trusts by and enhancing the flexibility that your clients may have. An irrevocable trust cannot be amended or modified by the settler. Um, while that's true, Trust may be modified or decanted by trustees and others. Uh, many states allow a trust instrument uh, to be modified in a limited way. Um, but sometimes that allows, uh, if it is allowed by the trust instrument, trustees can amend in order to preserve a tax benefit in a way that's not inconsistent with the intentions of the trust. Um, there's a traditional state law doctrine of merger, where if you have two trusts that are substantially similar, they can be pushed together. Um, the survive in, their, in that situation, they have to be fairly close um, to avoid changing beneficial interests, um, but you do have some degree of flexibility by picking which trust would be the survivor of that merger. Uh, 
Um, that's also useful as a cleanup mechanism when you're administering an estate or you, and you have several trusts that have been created, but they're all kind of the same. Um, again, that's a traditional concept, mildly useful, but the real action is on the next item, which is larger scale modifications, where trusts allow decanting of the assets from one trust to another and possibly very different trust instrument within certain guidelines. Um, state areas and state laws in this area are rapidly evolving. Um, some states have enacted decanting statutes with specific requirements, while others permit decanting under state law. Uh, there are decanting statutes in Delaware, Florida, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, New York, South Dakota. Other states have committees that are studying the area, and I expect to see more activity over the next couple of years. Now, New York, for example, has a fairly well-defined statute that goes over the extent of decantings based on the trustee's discretion. If you have unlimited discretion, there's more you can do. If you have a ascertainable standard type of discretion, you can still decant, but there are, there are hard stops on things you can accomplish. Um, in addition to the states, other organizations uh, like state bar, state bar associations and ACTEC have uh, and are developing uh, formats for decanting statutes, and we'll see where, the, where this goes over the next couple of years. Just one, uh, one comment. You know, so decanting is sort of a crazy concept in some regard. Um, you know, when I first started practicing law, you know, a trust that was uh, deemed irrevocable actually was irrevocable. Um, <laughs> this sort of makes the trust revocable. Uh, I mean, now technically not at the uh, settler's request, um, but there's a thin veil here. I mean, let's be honest. Um, most of these somehow either the settler is initiating, involved in, or acquiescing somehow. Rare that, you know, suddenly this stuff would occur without any settler involvement. So, you know, that's number one. You have to be real careful about, you know, the settler just sort of sending out an email and saying, I want this trust changed because, you know, I've, I've deemed the world has changed or my kids have changed or whatever it may be. Um, it needs to really not be initiated by the settler. Uh, number two, uh, to the extent that these really broad modification uh, statutes are developing, you know, you could have really dramatic overhauls in these documents and you know query um on the one hand you know if you've got a trust that's a thousand years because you're in some place like wyoming you know fine i mean maybe things have evolved and you know maybe dinosaurs are back on the planet for all i know so things have changed so dramatically it doesn't pay to have all this on the other hand you know to the extent that 15 years later, everybody decides they'd like to change everything and change a, in a wholesale way. You know, query, do you, you really want to permit such? You know, if you're the settler, are you really allowing your grand plan to be altered significantly? And so, you know, you really have to give some thought to how much uh, permissiveness, I guess, if you're a settler creating this thing, um, how much you really want to authorize. There's no right answer, obviously, but something worth thinking about as opposed to another one of these, well, let's just allow for decanting and let's allow the trustee to use their discretion. All right, well, that that could be a pretty big sea change. So anyways. Yeah, no, no, it, it can. And that is that is worth in in uh, designing the trust, discussing with your client. Um, you, there, if, if your client feels that they absolutely do not want the trust to ever be decanted or potentially changed, you might be able to prohibit that um, specifically in your document. Um, now, it depends on the state law. Um, some states, it's in the common law that if you have unlimited discretion, you can make distributions with or without a decanting statute. Um, um, there's a case in New Jersey regarding the J&J &J trusts that uh, was instructional on this issue uh, before there were decanting statutes. Um, New York has case law that's similar, um, and in some states like uh, South Dakota and some of the western states, uh, they've really, I wouldn't say simplified, but they've created a pattern where you can get court approval um, of the decanting um, in a way that sort of encourages you to go ahead and do that. Uh, they're trying to make it a little easier, but it's worth having that conversation with your client because if that's something that they, that they truly do want to prohibit, then you, you really should put that in the document itself. 
that leads to what might the tax effect of the of these types of decantings be? Uh, what why might the, uh, the tax effect be? And uh, hang on, I'm having an issue with the slideshow. There we go to the next slide. The latest earlier this year, the IRS approved a modification of an existing insurance trust to hold life insurance. Um, <clears throat> here it wasn't exactly a decanting, but it was pretty close. And I will tell you that the IRS has reserved on the decision of what a decanting means for federal estate and gift taxes. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, the advice has been to look to the safe harbors for grandfathered trusts as a way of determining what would probably, probably be acceptable. But the IRS has not yet ruled on that particular issue. This is a close, as close as we've gotten recently. Um, here, the trust was not intended to be a, an, irrevoc an irrevocable insurance trust. Um, the primary beneficiary was the sole trustee. It sounds like a fairly typical type of beneficiary uh, descendants lifetime trust that's GST protected, generation skipping tax. Um, here, a separate insurance trustee was appointed to deal with that particular asset and the primary beneficiary released powers that would have potentially caused the state tax inclusion. So they essentially uh, modified an existing trust just for this particular asset to avoid uh, uh, inclusion under the uh, rules governing life insurance policies. But again, this is as close as we've gotten to a decanting ruling, um, and it was earlier this year. Um, so uh, before we get to questions, we have a couple more subjects to discuss, um, such as trust confidentiality um, and the uh, duties to inform and report. And as John mentioned, um, this is something that often gets overlooked, but really it's a big deal. Um, and clients should be spending more time uh, considering these issues. Uh, you know, understandably, most clients may have concerns about how the knowledge of the trust and the extent of its assets could undermine a beneficiary's ambition or just general motivation in life. Um, beneficiaries of uh, some types of trusts, particularly crummy trusts, do receive notice of the trust's existence. Um, I'm sure you've been involved in situations where uh, you make a, a client makes a gift to a trust. There's a withdrawal right under the crummy case. And then as part of the trust administration, the beneficiary is supposed to receive a notice um, of the gift. Well, when they receive notice of the gift, they're going to receive notice of the trust. Um, and that may stem uh, other questions coming from that notice. Um, one way to avoid that is to simply design the withdrawal rights so that the beneficiaries you don't want to receive notice of the trust, they're not going to receive a notice of the gifts. Um, so we have a yikes here. Um, under common law, there are fiduciary duties that the trustees uh, must provide information to beneficiaries upon request when they're adults. Um, in other jurisdictions, they may have to do that as an affirmative basis Typically, it's an ask and receive kind of thing, but that does vary by state. Um, some states permit more privacy, but m many do not. Just a quick comment. I mean, this is just another area where, you know, rarely discussed. People draft, you know, core documents, wills, revocable trusts, and um, rarely ask these questions, in my in my opinion, and end up with these documents that permit uh, or require actually um, full disclosure at 18. It's just, I've, in all my practice years, I really have not seen where somebody was really willing to provide full transparency to an 18 year old over uh, their family's resources. So sort of surprised, I mean, you know, probably one of the most common places it comes up is somebody sets up an UTMA or UGMA account, forgets about it, suddenly it's, you know, worth $700,000, and the uh, custodian organization uh, says, hey, you know, we need to send your kid a check. Uh, they're 18 or 21, and the family panics and thinks somehow they're going to divert these funds, um, which Technically speaking, they're not supposed to be able to because their control over them has ceased. It, it does. That has to be a voluntary act by the child if they want to do something else with it. Um, oftentimes, they can be convinced, but the power structure shifts to the beneficiary then to agree. It's their money at that point. So, 
all I'm noting is that in the world of practicality, most people are not seeking to provide information at the age of 18, yet it's often a default uh, in a lot of these arrangements. Yeah. Um, so we have a few examples here. Um, some jurisdictions, and the names won't surprise you, these are the same jurisdictions that have made it their business to be in the trust business, Alaska, Delaware, Nevada, South Dakota. Uh, there are statutes that permit, that permit blind trusts where the beneficiary doesn't receive notice and doesn't necessarily know what's going on with the trust. Um, a, a different way of doing that, uh, Delaware also allows and Florida allows a designated representative to receive notice on behalf of the beneficiary. Now that presupposes that you have someone who's appropriate to receive notice um, and raises the potential issues about what are that what are the uh, the obligations of that designated representative? Um, you know that would be a touchy place to be in if later on the child is unhappy with what the designated representative has done. Um, but those that paradigm is out there. Um, then you have the exact opposite going on in some states like Maryland which require notice of the trust beneficiaries and reporting to begin at age 25. Uh, the trustee must begin to, to send reports to, to the beneficiaries every year. And there's really no way around that if you're in that jurisdiction. And again, these are things that are typically overlooked. You know, again, if you've got, you know, Aunt Tilly and Uncle Bob serving as a trustee, you know, the likelihood is they don't even know that they have a reporting obligation. And the problem is, you know, if the kids get unhappy later in life and they've been blind to their trust assets, um, you're in a world of hot water. It's, it is a tough courtroom to walk into and say, you know, oops, or I didn't really think it was that important. Um, but yeah, they're broke. Uh, <laughs> you know, we made some bad choices. You're going to get hammered. And most of these uh, friendly trustees you know, they have no E&O coverage. So the fact is that you're going after ghosts in many of these cases. Um, so it's a tough spot to be in. You know, if, you, if you fail to report, I don't think you're going to come out on top. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of fiduciary liability, unless there's something in the agreement that, uh, that uh, alleviates your, your duty to provide information to beneficiaries, um, you know, in counseling trustees, one of the worst situations I can picture is the yeah, the, for whatever reason, the trust assets have eroded. The beneficiaries receive no communication or no notice from the um, from the trustee, and there's no there's nothing in the trust instrument that says you don't need to be doing that. The trustee has very little uh, very little argument there, and a lot of liability. Um, so, from a purely from a trustee point of view, you may want to be in a state that allows for um, you know, has a notice paradigm or a reporting paradigm that's consistent with the way the trust will actually be administered. I mean, that covers a lot of the substance of what we wanted to go over today. I know it's a lot to absorb, um, but we can backtrack to uh, any of the subjects. Or if you have additional questions, uh, please feel free to type into the right side of your screen. Um, there's an area for questions to be communicated. Or unmute your, uh, your phone or computer, and you can, uh, we can go over questions at this point. Yeah, the good news is we got through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, so we're, we're, we're really only about 35 minutes or so in. So if you have some questions, feel free to ask. If not, we'll, we'll cut you loose and you can go to lunch early. So we're just we're sort of sitting back waiting for questions. So we'll, we'll see if we get any. If we don't, we'll, we'll dismiss you folks. At any rate, while we're waiting for a few questions, you know, again, I'll just say this uh, because I do believe, you know, this is a place where advisors can add a lot of value. Um, you know, number one, just to simply ask the question is, is, you know, state location being considered as part of the client's planning? Um, are people thinking about these issues? You know, um, and if so, what's the thinking you know where are we heading and on what basis um are these decisions being made you know and to the extent that you are 
part of an organization that offers professional fiduciary services, you may want to emphasize your connectivity to places like South Dakota or Delaware um, and the importance of those features and even the importance of, you know, E&O coverage um, and really being in the business of understanding these obligations and making sure they're fulfilled. Yeah. And then as part of that, even if the client is not necessarily going to want to proceed with a Delaware or South Dakota trust or whatever the jurisdiction may be, as an advisor, um, it's important to, to note that that's an option um, because you wouldn't necessarily want the clients to be hearing about those options from someone else after the fact. At least this way, you've, you've uh, done a thorough job of discharging uh, your obligations by informing them of what's out there. And if the client elects to make a different decision, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but at least, you, you know, you've educated them about the issue. And, and by the way, this, you know, this stuff also applies to what people consider sort of rudimentary business, you know, uh, a life insurance trust or a so-called uh, islet. You know, so just because you have a life insurance policy in there and nothing else doesn't mean that you can uh, not, you know, or you can avoid providing statements about the product. Uh, to the beneficiaries, you know, because you don't want them to know the face amount or something along those lines. Um, and it also doesn't mean that the uh, fiduciary has, you know, no real obligations because there's nothing in there, arguably, until somebody passes away. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. You have all the same obligations that you would regardless of the uh, of the asset class that's being held in this trust. Yeah. And then and on the subject of insurance trust, which is uh, I know it's a little uh, a little specific, but that that relates back to one of the subjects we discussed earlier about directed trusts and picking your jurisdiction. Um, many people will, may view the insurance as a totally separate component, but remember, especially for larger policies, that trust may end up at the end of the day receiving interest in a business uh, or, or other closely held assets um, because they're purchased later on after someone passes. So picking the jurisdiction for those kind of trusts really should be keyed to the long-range plan for the client, uh, including if there's a, to be an investment advisor or a business advisor or things of that nature. Uh, insurance trusts are, may be one of the uh, often overlooked uh, planning techniques that people tend to think of as very simple. Um, you really need to view them in the whole context um, so that, it's, uh, uh, you know, that the client's plan legacy planning is coordinated properly. Well, we didn't get any questions, I think, because this presentation was so uh, self-explanatory and Mike, you know, is such a uh, remarkably capable presenter. So we're going to we're going to let you guys go here. It's about 20 of the hour. Just remember, you're going to you'll be able to get access to the slide deck and the recording. Um, so you'll have everything that we have. Um, again, if there's any questions uh, after you can reach either of us, I'm at. Uh, Email wise, J, the letter J, Forster, F O R S T E R, at bakerlaw.com. And uh, Mike is at uh, M Vito, V I T O, at the same uh, moniker. So thank you uh, for participating today. We really appreciate your time. Hopefully, you found this uh, useful. Take care, and we'll, uh, we'll be back with you soon. Thank you.